Hey everybody, this is the adolescence video notes. So this will be the fourth set of notes completed for this unit. So let's get started talking off a lot about what you're going through right now. So when we talk about the physical development for adolescents, we perceive it to technically begin with puberty, okay? That tends to occur for most people within the age of 11 to 14. Um, we consider puberty to be that, uh, that component because that's when sex organs physically mature, okay? Obviously, this has pretty important implications for um, the way you end up perceiving yourself in comparison to your peers and ultimately your self-image in general because self-image is very greatly affected by um, when you physically mature. If you are somebody who is uh, maturing slightly um, more slowly in comparison to your peers, that obviously can have an impact on how you perceive yourself. And likewise, if you mature far more early in comparison to your peers, that can have an impact as well. Early maturing boys do tend to be better, athletically speaking, um, in terms of sports. They are generally more popular and they do have more of a positive self-concept, okay? But here's the interesting side effect to this, or I shouldn't say side effect, but it's definitely an interesting component to take a look at in terms of an opposite end of the spectrum. Those early maturing boys also have more difficulty in school. They tend to have higher uh, delinquency issues, um, so they, they end up kind of having a lot of problems with following the rules. They can also tend to become more heavily involved in substance abuse, doing drugs, and in some cases abusing them. Um, and so it, what we kind of take a look at as the answer for that is because they seemingly kind of tend to look older. Um, and so to their friends, they are kind of you know, the older boy. Um, and, and that can have implications for um, certain things. In the long run, though, it's important to recognize that these aren't always you know, applicable to every single person. But in terms of long run implications, too, it's important to recognize that they are, um, in later life, typically more responsible and cooperative, which could lend um, an answer for that piece being that they, they kind of learned from some of their mistakes because they matured early. They kind of caught on to some of the things that they shouldn't do uh, because of that scenario. And so they end up being more cooperative and, uh, and you know, more responsible later on when they're adults. Early maturing girls. In terms of their typical experiences, they are um, considered to be more popular as well. They're typically more heavily sought after by um, by individuals for dates um, and for you know those kinds of relationships than later maturing girls. Um, however, it is important to recognize that early development for girls can be an embarrassing scenario. Um, many girls can share, for example, uh, particularly those who matured pretty early. Uh, you know, finding out that they had gotten their period, for example, and being the first one that they knew to have it, um, and that having some kind of implications because people found out, and then they were made fun of and teased and all of those other kinds of things. So um, each of those can, scenarios can have benefits and downsides to them. So can late maturation as well. So those who end up maturing uh, in a slower rate compared to their peers often end up struggling with psychological issues, okay? Um, boys that develop later are smaller. They can have less coordination. Um, often that ends up meaning that they're not good athletically speaking. So they end up getting teased and picked on. They're perceived as less attractive. Um, and so in, in, in turn, the boys can end up then ultimately um, viewing themselves in that exact same way. So that's an important component to take a look at. Girls who develop later are also at a disadvantage when it comes to their junior high and then their early high school status because they hold such a low social status for things. They'll get overlooked in terms of the dating scenario. But interestingly enough, they end up reporting greater satisfaction with their bodies later when they're older, um, mainly because we've seen this through some research, late maturers, they do tend to be taller and slimmer, um, which by our standards, is kind of the societal ideal for what is perceived as really pretty. Um, so, you know, it, it's very much that scenario of ugly doc, duckling, uh, you know, turning into the swan, if you will. For cognitive development, typically by this point in your experiences, because y'all are over 14, so you've hit physical maturity uh, for the most part. Um, well, so we're gonna move on to the cognitive piece of this. Usually by this, 
scenario, you're in the formal operational stage, so you have, hypothetically speaking, the capacity for abstract reasoning. You can look at things in hypothetical scenarios. You can use deductive reasoning to take a look at things in terms of consequences for your actions or things like that, which ultimately ends up lending toward better understanding of um, various different things, specifically moral principles. And so the guy that ended up studying moral development in particular was Lawrence Colbert. You've heard me make mention to him a couple of times, and we'll do a couple of activities in class with one another when we uh, kind of take this stuff and, and go a little bit more in depth to make sure you understand his different stages, because uh, he's very much of a discontinuity view that you hit stages in terms of your development of morality. So he believed, after studying a, a, you know, a whole bunch of younger boys, that moral reasoning is going to help us to guide our judgments and our actions. And the reason why he came to this conclusion was because of the proposed dilemmas that he gave to boys at different age ranges to see what their various different reasonings were for the answers that they provided. His theory was basically that people go through levels of morality and moral development in very fixed orders for things. So he didn't ascribe age ranges necessarily with matching to the levels, but he did believe that for the most part, it wasn't possible for you to get to his highest level of morality, which we'll talk about in a second, until you were at least 13 because cognitively you just couldn't comprehend it or understand it any earlier than that point. Um, and so his whole point in trying to study this and understand it was then ultimately to, with the knowledge of where you could fall in terms of your developmental stage, be able to help you learn morals and progress in terms of your moral thinking um, by providing some of the dilemmas that he gave. And we'll do a couple of those in class so that way you can kind of see where you fall um, in comparison to some of these stages. So let's talk about this. You got pre-conventional, conventional, and then post-conventional. That's the one that is going to happen when you're 13, okay? Pre-conventional, you are going to perform actions based on reward or punishment, okay? So in this scenario, it makes sense that little kids are going to be predominantly in this level of things because they learn what's considered to be okay and not okay from reward and punishment. Okay, they're very self-centered in the sense that, um, you know, they just, they, they're going to do something that is moral, quote unquote, because it benefits them. They get some kind of reinforcement or they're going to do something, you know, they're not going to do something amoral um, because they get punished if that's the case. So little kids, for example, learn not to steal cookies um, when they've been told they're not supposed to because they get punished for that. Likewise, if a child learns how to share their toys, they get some kind of reward, they get acknowledgement, they get attention, so they learn, okay, sharing is something that I should do, okay, and that's how they acquire their sense of morality. Conventional morality is when traditionally we tend to complete moral activities because we want to please others or because it's what society says we're supposed to do. So we don't necessarily um, do it because we think that we really, 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 really believe in it. We're just doing it because it's what we're told, we're, uh, in a sense, is, you know, what we should do. For a lot of kids, that's kind of a hard one to differentiate because it sounds really similar to pre-conventional morality in the sense that, like, you're, you know, you're told that you shouldn't steal because society says that you shouldn't steal. But if you think about it in the differentiation of fact that pre-conventional is when things are going to be established because of those rewards or punishments, then you'll build up accordingly to that conventional stage, okay? When you're in the conventional stage, you're going to consider more than just yourself. You think of things like your family, your loved ones, society as a whole, and that's ultimately what makes that different from that earlier pre-conventional stage as well. Then you hit post-conventional, and this was the stage that uh, Colbert actually said he didn't think that most people were going to be able to get to this level. Um, Post-conventional is when you use higher level judgment and reasoning to guide your behavior. You look at things like justice, like equality, like the idea of human rights that everybody deserves to have them. And that's ultimately what is your determining factor to your moral development. If you look at it by living by the golden rule of do unto others as you would want done for you, then you know it makes it a little bit easier to follow this particular level as well. As I said, Colbert didn't think that most people made it to this level of reasoning. He believes that for the majority of us, we stay in the conventional stage. Um, but like I just got done sharing with you guys a little bit ago, we'll do a couple of activities with this to kind of help you better understand that. Now let's move to social development, which for adolescents in particular is incredibly significant. 
the person who we study and focus on the most in terms of their theoretical knowledge of this area is Eric Erickson. He's the first guy to actually study um, development fully 100% over a whole lifespan. If you think about some of these other individuals, they kind of stop after adolescence or early adulthood. But Erickson studied the whole shebang, and you'll see that as we move through his stages. Erickson looks at, um, ultimately, this key thing of interactions and in our understandings of one another and our knowledge of ourselves as members of society. So ultimately, what we mean by that is that when we hit certain stages at certain ages, we are presented with certain dilemmas, if you will, or problems. Um, and ultimately, there are, for every single one of these, two ends of the spectrum that we could come out on. Okay? Um, and so he, he perceived that these passages through stages um, end up involving us needing to resolve certain conflicts to develop into what we're going to become. So let's talk about each of these. The first one is trust versus, mid versus mistrust. So this is from the age of birth to roughly eight, 18 months. The big question that we have to resolve in this stage is, can I trust the world? Because if you think about it logically, these individuals, these babies, they are dependent entirely on others for love, for affection, for every one of their needs to be met, for a roof to be over their head, to obtain food, to have water. Okay? So if parents care for you and you develop a strong attachment, you will have a sense of trust and recognize that there is predictability to your world. Okay? So um, you, know, you don't feel this, this level of um, paranoia or concern that things are not always going to go um, in a predictable manner, okay, or a way that you can kind of um, easily have some level of foretold knowledge of. If parents are inconsistent in providing for your needs, um, or you lack a level of attachment and care with the parent, then that causes the infant to develop a sense of mistrust um, or paranoia, okay? So you can see that in here we've used some synonyms for you to help you kind of uh, be able to better describe these for your FRQ answers, since you can't really use trust and mistrust in your explanations of the levels that they are uh, going to end up on an FRQ on the AP exam. So um, just kind of write those down for yourself uh, to keep those in mind as you move forward for things. Now, let me move myself down a little bit so you can see that beautiful piece of clip art. After you hit mistrust and trust, then you come to autonomy versus shame and doubt. So the big defining question or conflict here is, do I have control over my life? With this one, it's can I trust my world? With autonomy versus shame, it's do I, uh, do I have some say to an extent of independence, okay? Can I do things for myself to that, you know, to some extent, all right? If parents set boundaries, but they let the child make some decisions or do some things for themselves, the child is going to develop a will, okay? So they're going to develop the sense of um, motivation to an extent to be able to complete things and to do things, okay? That they can carry out tasks. They have that capacity. If children are overly restricted, so, you know, to, to kind of put it in context, maybe parents are overly anxious and cautious. They don't let their kids necessarily just, you know, explore things or um, do things that they perceive as unsafe because of fear that the kid will get hurt or something. If the child has um, those restrictive boundaries established for them, they don't know how to assert themselves, um, and so they can struggle ultimately. And likewise, at the opposite end of the spectrum, if the parent is too lenient, kids can become overly demanding and ultimately controlling, okay? So uh, they end up having, you know, um, this overwhelming sense of self-consciousness, that they're not capable of doing things on their own or for themselves or without someone else's help. Um, and so, you know, that can end up developing that mentality that you see in later years with learned helplessness um, that we've talked about multiple times throughout this unit. With stage three of Eric Erickson's development, you look at the concept of initiative versus guilt. This happens when the child is roughly three to six years old. So this one is, am I capable of doing things for myself, specifically in terms of creativity? Okay, so imagination, curiosity. So whereas autonomy versus shame and doubt is developing a sense of independence, initiative is acting on that sense of independence. Because a lot of times kids can get these confused, these first two, autonomy and shame and doubt and initiative and guilt, okay? 
So if a parent reacts positively to a child's creativity levels, their imagination, their level of curiosity, and they try to foster that and fuel it, those kids tend to have higher levels of confidence. Um, they're willing to take more risks uh, and, and safe risk, not just like risks willy-nilly. Um, and they do have higher demonstrations of self-confidence. They feel capable of doing things. Parents react negatively to their child's efforts at asserting themselves, okay? Um, they punish the child, for example, for trying to um, do things on their own, or they just refuse to let the child do that entire, uh, you know, without any cause to it. Um, then the child tends to struggle with regard to self-sufficiency. They expect everyone to do everything for them, um, or they don't know how to do things for themselves. They have low self-esteem, and they're pretty fearful of punishment simply just because any time that they attempted to assert that independence, um, it, it ended up backfiring and they were punished. For industry inf and inferiority, this is the fourth stage. The big conflict is, can I do things within social realms, okay? So what we do in this stage is we're really comparing ourselves with our peers. And if you think about it, in a lot of respects, we know that once puberty hits, right around like 11, 12 years old, we no longer see a demonstration of adolescents focusing significantly on their perception of what's important for their parents. They will start to pay way more attention to their peers, and it's their peers' assessments of things that tend to um, have a pretty high impact on behaviors that that adolescent is going to demonstrate. So it makes sense that you start to see this industry versus inferiority thing, this comparison to your peers right around that age of 11, right, or at least, you know, a couple years right before that point. If you feel like you can do tasks, that you're encouraged to do them, that you are capable of being successful at them, then obviously you'll develop a sense of pride um, and, you know, feel pretty confident about that. If, however, you feel in comparison to your peers, you're not capable of being successful at demonstrations of tasks and things along those lines, you have low self-esteem and you perceive yourself as being lesser in comparison to those you know. With identity versus role confusion, which is where you guys are right now, um, and I know that many of you will be able to identify this with this because I hear you talking about it constantly in class, about trying to figure out where are you going to go and what are you going to do with your life, what's your major, you know, all these other kinds of things. This one's really going to hit home for you, okay? So identity versus role confusion is typically between the ages of 12 and 20. You're trying to figure out where do I fit in this ginormous world of ours, okay? So you're going through the transition of being a kid to an adult. That's much of why I treat you guys the way that I do. I'm trying to get you prepped for what life is going to be like either next year or the year after, since you guys are juniors and seniors, to be on your own um, and know what will be expected of you as an adult. At the exact same time, you guys are trying to discover who you are, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, what your interests happen to be, areas that you want to spend your focus on for your collegiate years to go into an occupation that makes you happy, okay? If you are able to resolve this conflict toward the identity end, then you have a sense of who you are um, and you have a commitment to your future adult roles, okay? So you know that you intend to go into civil engineering. You know you're going to be a nurse. You know you're going to be a social worker. You know you're going to be a teacher, okay? You have a sense of who you are and what you want to accomplish. At the opposite end of that spectrum then, that role confusion is an inability to decide what role you play in things. Um, that leads to unstable identity. So you don't necessarily end up um, really feeling like you have a strong sense of who you are. You have a need to continue to try out all of these other different things or you change your major six times or you know you decide that you aren't entirely sure that you want to do, you know, a, a, or you, you know, go into college undecided and you spend those four or five years there and you still have no idea what it is that you want to do. Um, in some circumstances, it can end up leading to an adoption of socially unacceptable roles. This is a lot of times where you hear of people just kind of becoming um, very out of place. And so that's oftentimes when they end up uh, veering towards substance abuse and things along those lines. Then you have, within this whole aspect of identity versus role confusion, pressures to focus um, on what it is that you are trying to develop in terms of that um, sense of who you are and what your role in society is. And a lot of those pressures can come from any number of things. They come from parents. They come from um, peer groups. Maybe all of your friends know what they want to do, but you have no idea yet. 
um, school. I mean, we tell you constantly that you have to know about this because of tartan time. You meet with an advisory teacher for 45 minutes every week, and the entire goal of that time is for you to sit down and decide through various different things, what do I want to become, okay? Um, so this is a very, 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 very critical time in your life. It's paving the way for the continued growth you're going to have later on into your adulthood and can also end up impacting your next stage, uh, well, two stages from now, your generativity versus stagnation component. Erickson felt that in order to be able to resolve this conflict, you had to figure out what your role was before it would be possible for you to put yourself into relationships with other people. Okay, and you've actually, uh, I guarantee you've heard this kind of mentality before from parents and adults that, um, you know, high school relationships really aren't true relationships unless you know who you are and you're still trying to figure that out and find yourself. So high school relationships usually don't tend to be terribly serious or worth an awful lot of your effort. But for Erickson, he, he truly felt that it's not possible for you to express genuine love and affection toward another individual until you knew yourself, understood yourself and had a full knowledge about what you wanted to accomplish and be in your life. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of uh, an interesting take on things because you guys are so wired to want to be accepted and to have that connection. Um, so many of you, when we did our welcome work in, in motivation, you told me that um, your significant others or a desire for a significant other were pretty strong motivators for you. So to hear Erickson sit there and say, well, since you're probably not really aware of what you want to do and where your role is in this big, great world, you're probably not really capable of demonstrating true love in the sense of, you know, being able to have a fully committed relationship. For some kids, that's kind of a Debbie Downer style moment. Um, ultimately, whether you agree or disagree on this is, is certainly up for debate. Next, we move to intimacy versus isolation. So the big question that needs to be resolved here is, can I be loved? Okay, this is when we start to kind of veer away from the um, casual dating scenario to one that involves a fairly serious committed relationship. Okay, so uh, in terms of, you know, answering that question, one end of the spectrum is the development of that intimacy component, a deep attachment and affection and a sense of connectedness to another person. Um, it, ultimately, I, uh, you know, th it sounds kind of self-serving to say this, but it's true. I wouldn't have made the decision to marry my husband if it weren't the case. Um, I, I consider myself to be on that end of the intimacy spectrum. Um, when I accepted my husband's proposal, I knew, it, you know, when I said yes to him, that that was going to be a lifelong commitment, that I was going to spend the rest of my life with him and that uh, we were going to be a connected team working together to ensure that both of us were happy uh, and that our future children were happy. Uh, and that requires an awful lot of a deep attachment to somebody um, to make that kind of commitment. On the opposite end of the spectrum, you have isolation, which is that one tends to just kind of stay very, I don't want to say self-centered, because I think that word carries an awful lot of strong context to it. but you you focus still very much on yourself, okay? And so you're that kind of individual who just does the casual dating thing because you just don't want anything serious. You avoid close emotional contact because that just, you know, doesn't make you, you just don't feel comfortable with that kind of scenario. Um, obviously, that lends itself towards a sense of isolation because you're drawing into yourself and there there isn't a level of commitment or attachment to another individual in that regard. Another stage, the second to last stage, I know there's been a lot of these, but that's the whole point. Remember, Erickson is all about looking at the entirety of a lifespan rather than just a couple of earlier stages of things from when you're young. This is my current state right now, and it's the stage that many of your parents find themselves in right now. This is generativity versus stagnation, okay? So the big question that or conflict that needs to be resolved here is, do I feel productive in what I'm doing with my life? Okay, Am I giving something back to the world? It's a sense of making a difference through the various different things that you do, whether it be um, through ensuring that your children are going to be you know, positive contributors to society, um, whether you feel like you are you know, doing something of benefit at your job that you're involved in your community, okay? Um, if you resolve this conflict toward the generativity end, that means you're happy with your life. You feel like you feel a sense of accomplishment. You feel like you've made a difference. Um, I, I, 
I don't know that I'm at this end necessarily definitively, but it's been nice to have students that do come back every once in a while and share with me that this course in particular made them feel very, very, very prepared for being an adult, for going on and handling the level of responsibility that was needed to be successful in college and out in the real world. Um, so when I do have those moments, I certainly feel a level of generativity for what I do. At the opposite end of the spectrum, though, if you veer toward the stagnation piece, for all intents and purposes, this is a midlife crisis. You feel worthless. There's this preoccupation with uh, your own needs and how you, you don't feel like they're being met. You feel like you know life is getting shorter and um, you need to live in, in the moment and make yourself happy because you don't feel like up until that point um, you've been productive or you know uh, things along those lines. So then we bring ourselves to the last stage which is integrity versus despair. This is roughly 65 and up. The big question, because it is towards the end of the life cycle, is has it been worth it? You look back over your entire life and you want to see, ultimately, what all did you do and do you have any regrets, okay? So if you're at the integrity end of things, you're going to be able to look at your life happily, feel as if you've uh, accomplished a great many things that while you are not perfect you accept yourself for who you are and everything that you did um, and while there are things you wish you could go back and change ultimately you know that those mistakes or those pitfalls made you who you are and there's no need to go back and change them at the opposite end with the despair it's a sense of unhappiness because you do look back at your life with significant amount of disappointment with frustration with regret you feel like there's so much that you might have missed out on or wish that you could have fixed and done differently. Um, and so that would be the opposite end of that particular conflict level. So this is the end of the adolescence notes. I know that it seems weird to end it on uh, something that deals with being a 65-year-old or a member of um, AARP, but um, since Erickson does take a look at you know a lot, and he, to him, adolescence in particular was particularly pivotal um, in terms of this development of our, our psychosocial um, structures, we consider him to be part of that adolescent group of notes. So we'll do a couple of activities with one another in class to make sure you guys all feel pretty comfortable about this, including trying to come up with a, uh, a mnemonic, some kind of sentence to help you remember the order of these guys um, and you know the questions that they attempt to or the conflicts they attempt to address. But as is always the case, if you ever have any questions for me, don't hesitate to ask.